Uh, we are consolidating all of the economic development dollars that exist in disparate state agencies. We're bringing it under one roof, and we're putting the governor in charge of making economic <coughs> development decisions in this state. It will not just be one agency doing one thing and another agency doing something completely different. It will be under a strategic framework with priorities for the state of Oregon that give us the biggest long-term bang for the buck economically and the most job creation over the long term. In the Treasury, we're going to prioritize debt, and we will require the legislature to work with this, work with us. The governor decides where the debt should go. The legislature decides whether they agree with that and they authorize the debt. The Treasury then issues those instruments. We need to do that completely differently and prioritize our very precious debt capacity. Debt is the one tool that we have in this state to invest in long-term <coughs> economic development infrastructure that can help move our economy towards the future. Uh, so we are going to be focusing on trying to prioritize that flow of debt. We're already working with legislative leadership to create uh, a robust mechanism for strategic planning in the state of Oregon around the issuance of debt. The tools we have, like the Oregon Investment Fund and the Oregon Growth Account, some of you may have heard of, they are not as targeted on economic development as we think they are. Those tools need to be refocused towards our economic development priorities. We can do that and we'll continue to lead an effort with uh, legislative leadership to make that happen in the coming year. Well, I'm asking our legislative leadership um, to take a paradigm shift. And here's what it is. The paradigm of the 20th century was that it was incumbent upon citizens to register to vote. The new paradigm, the paradigm of the 21st century, is that the government's going to contact you as a result of services that you're already using. And what it will mean for you is that you're going to be spending less time doing voter registration and more time engaging and educating. Well, since I took office, we have uh, gone after over 100 major corporations. This is Wall Street <coughs> firms uh, like Oppenheimer and the Union Bank of Switzerland. It's big pharmaceutical companies like uh, Pfizer and Bayer. And as a result of that, we've recovered to date for Oregon taxpayers, for Oregon workers, for Oregon consumers and victims, about $80 million. And we've done that without spending a single taxpayer dime defending our new Affordable Care Act, the National Health Care Reform Bill. Uh, you may have heard 26 attorneys general around the country are fighting to have the bill declared unconstitutional. Uh, Oregon, we are going the other way. We are filing briefs to defend the constitutionality of the bill in every court uh, where it is challenged. We've been doing a series of cases to go after unlicensed businesses that are not licensed to do business with the state, that hire uh, workers who are undocumented, pay them much less than they're legally required to, pay none of their benefits. Um, we are not going to attract uh, the thousands and thousands and thousands of new jobs that we need in this state unless we give employers a reason to expand their businesses or to come here with the jobs. And one of the crises that we face in getting there is the age of our workforce and the inability to prove that we've got an education system that's training younger workers to replace them. We really wish that every worker in the state was a union worker. But the truth is, they're not. And those that, that don't have the benefit of union representation still need to be treated fairly. Oregon's 1955 Equal Pay Act only applies to discrimination between the genders in equal pay. And so we, uh, along with the Advocacy Commissions and the Oregon Council on Civil Rights, have presented a, have presented a bill to expand the equal pay protection beyond gender to all protected classes in the state of Oregon. We oftentimes go into a workplace that's suffering harassment or discrimination, and we're able to protect the employees, but oftentimes there are interns that are also in the workplace that are being subjected to harassment, and there are no laws in the state that protect the interns. So we have a bill that will um, expand the civil rights protections that protect employees to all interns and volunteers that are also performing work uh, for the employer as well. We have a bill that will say when you're an employer that's not taking care of your workers by paying them on time and in full, you have to pay, the employer has to pay the penalties that the employee is subjected to.
we will give every bit of effort we need and all the resources we have to make sure that this state does not roll back minimum wage and does not roll back the prevailing wage. For the to make sure that we are supporting employers that want to expand and create more jobs, that we are supporting workers who need retraining or workforce training. There's some specific programs. The Labor Commissioner has been a great advocate for uh, expanding career and technical education. Michael Dembro on the House side and I served on a task force to try to do that. And making sure that we are scrutinizing every penny that we either spend or give away in terms of tax credits. I think one of the really positive things that we were able to do uh, in our last session was sunset all of the tax credits that we give out so that each one of them is going to be reviewed both by a joint House and Senate committee and by a separate committee looking at the policies represented and then looking our taxpayers really getting the bang for the buck out of what we're spending because right now with this three and a half billion dollar deficit we don't want to be giving away money that is not coming back in in terms of job creation and, and those other positive things that, that those credits should be going to. We have a 3.5 billion dollar deficit in our budget. Uh, I am all budget all the time. I'm on full ways and means as well as uh, co-chairing the subcommittee for human services. Our goal is frankly, to not do a lot of damage. Do the best we can to balance a budget that protects all the essential services that keep the economy on the path to recovery, as well as protecting our most vulnerable citizens, maintaining our schools, you know, providing public safety. We have a very, very difficult task ahead of us. But again, I think we have a lot of skilled members on Ways and Needs, particularly on our side. And I think um, with the governor and his framework, and I think very proactive governor in terms of doing the right things, I think we're going to get out of it as best we can, but it will be very difficult. And I, and I know we all look forward to hearing from everybody about, you know, ideas of how we can do our job as well as we can in a very constrained budget environment. So I hope you're, you know, you spend a lot of time talking to your representatives. And finally, on a personal note, um, I wanted to let you know that uh, I am personally committed to demonstrating to the federal government that we are going to make progress on the Columbia River Crossing this session. <laughs> In reforming the initiative process, we've done about all we can on the statutory side to give uh, Secretary of State Brown and her staff the tools. And they, if you look at the number of initiatives that we have out there, it's been dramatically reduced. The content of them has not improved, however, at all. <laughs> so I think the only way we can take the next steps is to do some constitutional initiative reforms that fundamentally give voters a choice. I mean, right now, we ask voters, do you want to spend more money on this, and spend more money on that, and spend more money on that? And they all sound like good things, and so voters vote yes. We need to make it clear to them that these are choices. You can spend more money on this, but it's going to cost us in the classroom, or on the front lines of public safety, or on the front lines of health care. They've got to have a clear sense of those choices. And uh, so I think you're going to see initiative reform, which again will have to go to the ballot. And then we're working with uh, Secretary of State Brown and several of our colleagues around reducing the length of time that uh, right now Oregon has one of the longest periods of time to register to vote. Uh, we have some bills in that would create same day voter registration. Yeah. I'm not sure yes. we're going to get all the way to the same day, but we can dramatically reduce. We've got this outdated constitutional provision that was put in when the Rajneeshis were in the antelope. <laughs> 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 the time that it takes to require a vote. We're disenfranchising hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of Oregonians will be able to participate in the electoral process. We need to change that. That's a huge priority for House Democrats. So our goals, I think, are more focused, but probably no less ambitious uh, than they've been in the past. The road is going to be tougher, and we look forward to your partnership on that journey.